Okay, so hello again and welcome to um, our next lecture in uh, pneumatology. Um, I hope you've had a good week and um, hope you're enjoying the semester. I hope you're enjoying the, the content of, of these lectures. <clears throat> I certainly um, I enjoy presenting the lectures, not because I enjoy talking, but because it's it's my opportunity to go back through the material and and you know every time I research uh, these issues, it seems like I, I learn something new, and so this is really an opportunity for me to learn as well. So that's it's one of the joys of teaching. Uh, it's never boring, especially when you're teaching theology and the Bible, because it forces you to to push yourself and and dig deeper, and you always learn more. And so um, it it's certainly enjoyable for me. So. Um, in this lecture, we're going to discuss uh, some of the primary aspects of Paul the Apostle's pneumatology. Now, we're going to discuss six primary aspects, and we're kind of just going to jump right in. But I do want to say, before we conclude the lecture, that one of the aspects of Pauline theology or Pauline pneumatology is... Uh, the Spirit's role in regeneration. We are not going to discuss that as an aspect of Paul's pneumatology in this lecture. And the reason we're not going to discuss it in this lecture is because if you, if you finish out this program and you take Theology 5, particularly if you take Theology 5 online, you will probably take it with me. And we spend almost an entire semester talking about Pauline pneumatology. Um, because it, that's, 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 or Pauline pneumatology as it relates to regeneration. Um, Paul is instrumental in helping the Christian church understand what the Spirit's role is in salvation. So uh, we're going to pull up just a little bit short um, today, and I've wrestled with whether to do this or not, um, but have opted to, to save some for later. Um, and so uh, we're just kind of kind of dive right in. So, so we've, we've talked a lot about Luke's pneumatology when we discussed Luke and Acts. And the interesting thing about Luke's pneumatology versus Paul's is they have a bit of a different emphasis on the role of the Spirit. And what's so interesting about that is Luke spent years traveling with Paul, learning from Paul. And so the interesting thing about that is not that they have different pneumatologies, but that even even having even having spent all of those years together traveling and the influence that Paul had on Luke means that uh, what you find in Luke's pneumatology and Paul's pneumatology are not competing theologies but they are complementing theologies meaning that they are both part of what it means to have an orthodox theology. Even though they are emphasizing different things, both of the emphases that they have are part of the total picture. And so you have to think that just because Paul and Luke emphasize different things, doesn't mean that they held competing views as much as I think um, Paul was probably responsible for informing Luke's opinion. And then Luke, through his historical analysis of the gospel, of, of the life of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus, and then the life of the early church, um, I think that's where where he filled in some of the blanks, but they are, they do have a different emphasis 
And I think it's fair to say that while Luke might be more concerned with the activity of the Spirit as it manifests itself through believers, you know, he used the terms filled with the Spirit, full of the Spirit, uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit, used that twice in Acts. Um, Paul seems to have more of a diverse focus. And we're going to explore the diversity of his focus in this lecture. And so we're not going to discuss every single mention of uh, the Holy Spirit in Luke's writings. I mean, in Paul's writings, I just don't think we could do that. But I have identified six aspects of Pauline pneumatology. And here they are. So the first aspect is that the Christian, Paul emphasizes the Christian life as it relates to the Trinity. That's number one. Number two, Paul emphasizes God as indwelling spirit. Number three, Paul emphasizes uh, the natural man versus, or not versus, but the natural man and the spiritual man in relation to the Holy Spirit. He talks about the spirit of Christ. And then lastly, the spirit as sanctifier. So let's uh, let's jump into these and let's see if we can uncover um, some of <clears throat> some of Paul's pneumatology. So the first aspect is that Paul views the Christian life in light of the Trinity. So Paul envisions the Christian life as a threefold relationship to the Father, Son, and Spirit. Paul is primarily Trinitarian in his pneumatology. I don't know what lecture number this is. I think it's five. But that means five lectures in a row. You've heard me point back to the Trinity as an essential element to an orthodox pneumatology. So Paul was primarily Trinitarian in his pneumatology. So I'm going to read... Uh, from 2 Corinthians 13, 14. This is the, the last sentence of Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. And I'm reading from the ESV. He says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So according to Paul, the church enjoys fellowship with God and the Spirit originating in the love of the Father and mediated through the grace of the Son. In this passage, what we have is we have one of Paul's most poignant Trinitarian statements. So any discussion, any discussion of Paul's pneumatology begins with an understanding that Paul did not see the Spirit in the same distinct way that Luke or Peter do. He considers all acts of God, whether it's whether it's the activity of the Son of God, activity of the Father, or activity of the Spirit, he considers all acts of God to be an outpouring of the Trinity. Now, this doesn't mean that Paul viewed the Spirit indistinctly, meaning that the Spirit didn't have its own, uh, its own distinction, but he always views the Spirit in relation to the Father and the Son. So I think one of the passages that, that highlights this, I think, is from Ephesians, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. Paul says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you who were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So the first aspect of Paul's pneumatology is that Paul sees the work of the Spirit as it relates to the Trinity. So that's the first aspect. Second aspect of Paul's pneumatology is that Paul sees God, again, God as in Trinity, sees God as indwelling Spirit. Paul taught that believers receive the Spirit at conversion. Uh, in Galatians 3.2, he asked his readers a rhetorical question. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? It's a rhetorical question. You receive the Spirit by believing what you heard is what he's saying there. But he also remarks in Romans 5, uh, verse 5, uh, Romans 5.5, 5, that God's love is, quote, poured into our hearts by 
the Holy Spirit. So Paul and the first generation of Christians believe that they lived under, this is important, lived under the immediate government of the Holy Spirit. Now, what I mean by that is that Paul and the first generation of Christians adopted somewhat of an Old Testament concept when it came to, when it came to the role of the Spirit in the life of the church. So if you think back to God's, God's interaction with his people, we'll, we'll talk about from Abraham forward. We'll, we'll start at Moses, right? So the idea with the people in the wilderness for 40 years is that God would lead them. Once they were established in the land, God led them and would use judges to, to guide the people. At some point, the people looked around and saw that other nations had a king and they wanted to be like the other nations and they wanted a king. And God saw this as rejection. But God's ultimate will for his people is that the community of faithful would be led by the Spirit, would be led by God. So what Paul and the first generation of Christians did was they dedicated themselves as, as people of God to being led by the Spirit in the same way. That's why local churches in the first and second century look so much differently than they do today. After the apostles died, there, there was no central leadership. You know, James was gone. Paul and Peter was gone. They were all gone. And so each house church, because churches still met in homes in the second century, each house church was led by the Spirit through the leadership of elders. That's why elders were so important. And the, I think the church at Rome is a great example of that. None of the apostles, not Peter, not Paul, none of the apostles founded the church at Rome. And yet it existed as dozens of house churches led by the Spirit, each house church having elders when Paul wrote to the Romans. So the way the New Testament church identified themselves with the Spirit was that the Spirit was going to lead and govern the church. So the indwelling presence of the Spirit in Paul's letters was naturally occurring after conversion, and it was a necessary component in the life of the church. Paul would not have imagined a church without the leadership of the Spirit, which is a, a very interesting concept. We're not talking about some official, dry, theological, doctrinal statement about the Spirit leading the church. We're talking about a, a practical, divine presence through the Spirit guiding the activity of the church. Not just that the church adopted Jesus' mission and then tried to make good decisions that they thought aligned with Jesus' mission. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about people who gather, who gather in the name of Jesus, dedicated to Jesus's mission, and then the Spirit of God. And we talked about this last lecture. I, I made this statement. I said the, the mission of the Father is the mission of the Son, is the mission of the Spirit, is the mission of the church, right? So we're not just talking about Paul says, hey, align yourselves with Jesus, make good decisions, try to pick good elders and you should be good to go. That's not what Paul thought. That was not his theology. His theology is align yourselves with the mission of Jesus because you are filled with the spirit. And then as you gather together as the people of God to fulfill the mission of God, you should be practically and realistically led by the spirit in a very real way. Um, and so so that is another aspect of Paul's 
theology of the Holy Spirit. It's a very practical, um, um, very, very charismatic view of the role of the Spirit in the life of the church. It is not just some dead, dry, let's all be filled with the Spirit and try to be better people. This is a real, this is a real interjection of God's Spirit in the leadership of the church, which leads us to the next aspect, which is that Paul believed, number three, the third aspect is that Paul believed that the Spirit was involved in theophanic activity. So um, I'll spell that for you, T-H-E-O-P-H-A-N-I-C. So a, the, a theophany, T-H-E-O-P-H-A-N-Y, a, theophy, a theophany is a physical manifestation of God. Moses seen the burning bush, a theophany. The Spirit um, rushing into the upper room on the day of Pentecost is a theophany. So any physical manifestation of the divine, that is a theophany. So what Paul saw as his third aspect of his, his pneumatology is because he believed in the practical, real divine presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of not just the individual believer, but in the church, Paul saw theophanic activity as a sign of the Spirit in the church. Paul believed in healings. Tongues, prophecy, resurrections, prison doors opening, visions. Those are all theophanies. And so, so Paul associates the work of the Spirit as the active power or energy of the Trinity. Let me say that again. Paul associates the work of the Spirit as the active power or energy of the Trinity. So Galatians 3, 5. He attributes the miracles to the work of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, he attributes wisdom, knowledge, healing, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues, all to the work of the Spirit. And in 1 Corinthians 12, he says, all these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. And it's important to note that 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 even though Paul was fully on board with theophanic activity, meaning divine manifesta physical manifestations of the divine, Paul considered ecstatic gifts, which that's, that's not a negative term. That's just a term we use in theology too. It's another way to describe tongues, ecstatic gifts, not ecstatic meaning out of your mind and crazy, but ecstatic in that it is, it is different, it is not natural, and it is um, inspired elsewhere, meaning it is divinely inspired. So even though Paul was on board with theophanic activity as normative in the Christian church, he considered ecstatic gifts of tongues to be of secondary importance, believe it or not. So in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul places more importance over spirit-inspired intelligible speech than spirit-inspired tongues. So he placed more value on the spirit being involved in things you say that are intelligible than things that you say that are not intelligible or that require interpretation. He goes on to say that those that place value of tongues over the, over the value of intelligible speech, think like children. So <clears throat> hope you see how we're moving here with his, with his pneumatology. So that's the third aspect. So the fourth aspect kind of shifting away from, you know, theophanies or governance in the church and, and maybe honing more in on the individual believers interaction with the spirit Paul talks about the natural man and the spiritual man. So he draws a distinction between the natural man, which the Greek word is psukikos, the natural man. He draws a distinction between that and the spiritual man, the pneumatikos. And it's in 1 Corinthians 6 where Paul really digs into this distinction. And I'll let you look that up and I'll let you you study those passages, but in those passages, 
what we discover is that the natural man, according to Paul, is incapable of appreciating and recognizing the things of God. The spiritual man has been illumined by the Spirit and understands the deep things of God. So a central aspect of Pauline theology is that the Holy Spirit who fills the believer is the source of revelation and truth. The Spirit is the transformer of the human mind, according to Romans 12, that gives converts the mind of Christ. So according to Paul, it's only because of the Spirit that men and women are able to receive the truth of the gospel. That's 1 Thessalonians Thessalonians 5. Because it is contrary to the world, known and understood by the natural man. So for Paul, there was a difference between the natural man and the spiritual man. There were things that only the natural man could understand. And there were things that the spiritual man could understand. And Paul genuinely believed that without the intervention of the Holy Spirit, human beings could not understand the things of God. Whether it's the gospel, whether it's the teachings of the church, whether it's ethics and morality that that come from God, Paul believed that without the intervention of the Holy Spirit, humans could not understand the things of God. That was the extent to which Paul believed in the, the sinfulness of man, coupled with the grace of God. Because what that means is if you have someone that is unregenerate, if you have someone that is not a Christian, but that understands spiritual concepts, you can attribute that to the Spirit of God working in that person, which I think it opens up an entirely new can of worms. Not that the Spirit indwells the person like he indwells a believer, but that the Spirit of God is working in both saved and unsaved people working in saved people to help them understand the mission and vision of Jesus, to help them resist temptation, to help them understand the Bible, to help them understand God's will, um, to help them to know what to say and when to say, to work through them with the spiritual gifts. But in the unsaved person, the Holy Spirit is working to help the unsaved, according to Paul, help the unsaved person understand the things of God. So the Spirit of God is involved in both both evangelism and discipleship. There's not an aspect of God's kingdom. Guys, I need you to hear this. There is not an aspect of God's kingdom that the Holy Spirit is not the conduit through which we understand and experience the kingdom of God. It's important that you get that. Pneumatology. The, the Holy Spirit is not a is not an extra member of the Trinity that we call upon when we need something. It is the Spirit of God that allows us to understand and participate in the life of God. Without the Spirit of God, there is no regeneration. Without the Spirit of God, there is no sanctification, which we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. But without the Spirit of God, there is no understanding or activity or no interaction with the kingdom of God. And that's that comes from Paul, his whole discussion of the natural man and the spiritual man. All right, so what is the fifth aspect of Paul's pneumatology? Paul talks a lot about the spirit of Christ. Um, he refers to the Holy Spirit as the spirit of Christ, and it is one of the most distinctive features of Paul's pneumatology. So referring to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Christ did at least two things for Paul's readers, both in the first century and today. So number one, by making the connection between the Holy Spirit and the Son of God, the Christ, by making that connection, he rescued the church from focusing on the charismatic gifts apart from the work of Christ. The second thing that he did by connecting the Holy Spirit and Christ 
is it aligned the purposes of the Spirit with the purposes of the Messiah in the building of God's kingdom, in the making of disciples, and in the ministry to the abused and the afflicted. So additionally, invoking Spirit of Christ removed any notion that the Holy Spirit operated at the behest of the believer. The Holy Spirit doesn't answer to the believer. Rather, the Holy Spirit acts upon the will of Christ. And then lastly, by aligning the Holy Spirit with the risen Christ, the readers are reminded, Paul's readers are reminded, that if Christ was raised by the Spirit, then the church has the assurance that their participation will, will certainly happen at the resurrection by that same Spirit. So the Spirit of Christ gives hope, aligns the mission of the church with the mission of Christ, prevents an abusive theology whereby believers think that the Spirit answers to them. And then from an eschatological perspective, the Spirit of Christ invokes the, the notion that the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will quicken our mortal bodies and raise us as well. So that's the fifth aspect. Christ, Spirit of Christ. Uh, the sixth aspect is Spirit as Sanctifier. So in Paul's letter to the Colossians in chapter 3, he encourages uh, the Colossians to, quote, clothe themselves with garments that are consistent with their new way of life. So in this passage in uh, Colossians 3, Paul is expressing a theological concept that he states explicitly elsewhere. That there is a change that should accompany the believer similar to the new clothes a new convert would wear in the first century when being baptized. So if you and I were to time travel and go back to the first century um, and become a Christian, this would be end of first century into the second century, really more second century. If we accept Jesus, then in most churches, um, we would attend the weekly services wearing a, a, a white garment. We would sit in a different place than everyone else. We would go through a year of catechesis, which is learning the teaching of the apostles. And then at the end of that year, uh, we would be baptized and we would be offered our first communion. So what Paul is saying in Colossians 3 and where he said, says elsewhere that the change that should accompany a new believer is similar to the new clothes that new convert would wear when being baptized. And this change is referred to as sanctification. So the purpose of this lecture is not to explore sanctification, but to highlight Paul's view that the spirit is the agent of sanctification. So Paul does not attribute sanctification solely to the spirit because Paul is Trinitarian in his pneumatology. Paul, although the, although the spirit might be the, the primary agent of sanctification, sanctification is a function of the Trinity. So that makes sense to you. So Paul mentions that the Holy Spirit is the agent of sanctification in just a few passages. You got Romans 15, uh, verse 16, where he says we are sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Um, 2 Thessalonians 2.13, uh, God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Um, again, in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 1 through 8, uh, 1 Corinthians 6.11. So Paul sees the work of sanctification to be natural and necessary in the life of believers. So in Paul's view, Christians are not what they were and not what they will be. But through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, believers are becoming what they eventually will be at the parousia. Now, I think whatever you think of sanctification, 
That's how I want you to begin to view sanctification. If you can imagine your life on a line, a timeline, maybe over here is the day you receive Jesus as your savior. And over here is when you step into eternity at the end of time, right? So that line would be your Christian experience. What Paul is saying is that at the moment of salvation and forward, at any given point moving forward, you are not what you were, but you are not what you will be. For Paul, the Christian life was not about becoming. I mean, it was not about arriving and staying in one spot. It was about becoming. And for Paul, that's what sanctification was. Sanctification was not just this tearing off of the old man, not just this release of habits and hangups. You know, we don't say sin anymore in the church. We just say struggle. I'm struggling, right? Uh, my pastor says that all the time, so I, I stole that from him. But but we're not just talking about not struggling anymore. We're talking about this radical transformation brought about by the Spirit that doesn't stop until you are what you were intended to be apart from the temptations and the trappings of this world and the sinfulness of this world. And so for Paul, the spirit is the agent in that. So those six things uh, are, are the essence of Paul's pneumatology. And I think as you, what I'd like for you to do as you're doing your devotional reading, as you are uh, studying the letters of Paul uh, moving forward um, and thinking about what Paul's pneumatology is, I'd like for you to think about uh, those six aspects. So I hope you got some of, something out of this lecture. I hope maybe you understand Paul's thinking a little better. Um, as always, if you have questions or comments for me, send me an email or send me a text. But uh, thanks for paying attention, and I'll talk to you soon.